What's going on guys? We're back and welcome to Subjectively, the channel where we discuss the art of character design in the context of popular media. My name is Jack, and today we're going to be deviating from the regular formula of Pokemon or League of Legends focused content. The topic of today's video can be applied to both franchises, however. In fact, it's a subject matter that we've touched on briefly in a few of our previous uploads. Today, I want to talk about why, when, and how human character designs impact their respective stories. Are designs that are human or humanoid inherently more appealing? Do certain audiences empathize more with anthropomorphic characters? When is it appropriate to make a character anything but human? Of course, there will never be a hard and fast answer to any of these questions. Like many aspects of art and design, this is all incredibly conditional. We can't give you a cheat sheet to reference and fill in the right answer. Our goal today is to open up a conversation with the hope that it will get you thinking and give you as an artist, or a consumer of art, a more complex perspective on this incredibly intricate subject. We'll take a look at a handful of examples wherein human and non-human character designs are used, and what level of success these choices accomplish in their respective contexts. We're also going to look at some of my own artwork, and talk a little about my experiences, problems, and solutions in relation to this topic. If you enjoy the video, be sure to leave us a like and let us know down in the comments. Like I said, this is a little bit different kind of content than we usually do, so it would be great for me to know if you guys like to see more of it in the future. Okay, I'd say that's a fairly sufficient intro. My high school English teacher would be impressed by my rudimentary essay writing skills. But enough fluff, let's get into the video. We're going to start at the very beginning. No, not that far back. Come on, this is about humans. Let's get to a point in history where humans actually existed. Here we go. These are the Guion Guion rock paintings of Western Australia. Archaeologists believe that these figures were painted somewhere between 12 and 22,000 years ago, making them some of the earliest known pieces of human-made artwork in history. You might also argue that these paintings are some of the first character designs ever recorded, as each figure is thought to represent different themes and concepts that were significant to its creators. Some researchers distinguish specific accessories, tools, and even weapons on the figures, such as tassels, headdresses, spears, and boomerangs. The characters are also seen taking on different poses, some moving, others completely stationary. Something very interesting about these figures is that they're thought to be facing inward towards the rock's surface. This has not been confirmed, but it would explain why certain physical features like genitalia are not clearly distinguished. Why am I showing you these paintings? Well, because they're stunning, first of all, and are symbolic of our origins as a sentient social species. But more specifically, these paintings represent some of the core merits of character design. They capture what life was like for the ancient people who created them. In their own way, these abstract figures tell a story about the lives of their artists, what was important to them, what drove them to not only survive but to live and enjoy life. In other words, they serve the same purpose as any piece of art or character design does in the modern day. In this case, human figures are used to represent these themes. It makes sense, right? Humans made these paintings, humans were intended to observe and consume this media, why wouldn't the subject of the piece be primarily human characters? Well, let's look at some other ancient cave art. This is the Cave of Altamira in Cantabria, Spain. The charcoal drawings and polychrome paintings of this World Heritage Site are thought to be even older than those found at Guion Guion, painted around 36,000 years ago. Here, we see no human figures. Instead, the ancient humans of Cantabria recreated in stunning detail the wildlife that they shared their home with. Bison, deer, horses, and boar are clearly depicted with such accuracy that they could be referenced by paleontologists to get a better understanding of how these animals looked in life. Unlike the people of Guion Guion, these artists chose to represent what was most important to them in non-human characters. The animals that sustained them also became the main subject of their artwork, and we see the dichotomy of human versus non-human imagery start to take shape. Could we argue that one of these characters is a more successful design than the other? Perhaps, but there are a lot of factors at play here. For one, a difference in culture and place of origin that affects how and why each artist created what they did. We also have to consider the gap in time between the two findings. And, like all art, these paintings are subject to a viewer's personal experiences and opinions. Any human to have seen these works in the thousands of years since their conception will have a different reaction to them. Some might favor the animals, while others find the humanoid figures more compelling. 
So the same factors that determined the artist's intentions behind these works also impact the opinions of any viewers who would see them. As humanity progressed through the ages and into the modern day, these factors continued to define the way each civilization represented their culture. Consistencies began to develop, and design tropes were established, some of which persist in artwork to this very day. The spider, clever, manipulative, cunning, and ingenuitive. In many myths and cultures from around the world, this non-human character is used to represent a slew of human personality traits. The Greek poet Ovid describes the origin of the spider in his poem Metamorphoses, wherein the weaver Arachne is transformed by the vengeful goddess Athena. In the Akan culture, the character Anansi is a popular mythological figure whose adventures consist of outsmarting adversaries with quick wit and creativity. And in the oral traditions of the Lakota people, another spider trickster known as Untomi swindles the hero Stone Boy out of his clothes. The Dragon an enigmatic entity representing everything from might to wisdom to greed. The Chinese have countless myths and legends surrounding dragons, often used to explain natural phenomenon or divine intervention. In many Western European cultures, dragons are seen as more antagonistic forces, stealing livestock and burning villages with their fiery breath. The many different sources that describe such creatures creates a myriad of visual designs that vary from culture to culture, and include consistent features like claws, toothy mouths, scales, and wings. The Golem A word originating from the Hebrew language that describes an inanimate object made by man and given life through supernatural means. Stories revolving around these bizarre inhuman characters have inspired such pop culture phenomena as Frankenstein's monster, Pinocchio, and even a handful of Pokémon. These are just some of the many examples of non-human characters that have existed in storytelling for thousands of years. Coexisting alongside us throughout history, they represent the aspects of our lives that transcend our physical existence. Fear, control, nature, technology, government, family, darkness, and light. These things are much too difficult for humans to comprehend without corresponding imagery to contextualize them in ways that we're familiar with. So, we create characters that take the place of these intangible concepts. This method of storytelling has been so successful that these visual metaphors continue to be relevant in the modern day. Seeing as we've made it back to 2022, it might be appropriate for us to look at some contemporary examples of non-human characters and what role they play in our present day culture. It should come as no surprise to any of you that there are hundreds of iconic non-human characters that have been impacting popular culture for decades. Some notable names include SpongeBob, Mickey Mouse, and Pikachu. These three characters in particular were designed to be enjoyed by a primarily younger audience, which might explain their animal-inspired appearances. Other factors that played a role in each of their creations include ease of animation, marketability, and the personal interests of each of their creators. Of course, not one of these three characters is without their anthropomorphic features. I don't want to ruin anyone's childhood here, but most sponges don't have eyes, mouths, fingers, teeth, or shoes. And if Mickey and Pikachu actually looked like rats, well, let's just say they might not be as popular as they are today. But why is that? Why can't we create a character that's, say, just a slug? There's a lot that's interesting about slugs, and you could make some pretty compelling stories about these shellless mollusks. Well, I mean, of course you could do that, there's absolutely nothing stopping you. But like with any piece of art, you need to consider your audience when you do so. Humans are complicated animals, and it goes without saying that no two people are exactly alike. But we are a social bunch. Our success as a species on planet Earth is due in part to our empathy, emotions, and ability to communicate. Not just verbally, but through our expressions. You might not think about it much, especially in a time when a lot of communication is done over Discord or through the comment section of a YouTube video, but humans can say and interpret a lot from their physical expressions. No matter what language you speak or where you come from, a smile is universal. You can always tell when someone is shouting at the top of their lungs, and when someone's eyes begin to water, you'll feel a similar emotion overcoming yourself. A slug is incapable of any such expression. This isn't to say that slugs don't feel the same things as we do, perhaps they do, but most people wouldn't be able to interpret these feelings without those recognizable human expressions. So if you look at iterations of slugs in popular media, they tend to add a few more anthropomorphic features like pupils, eyebrows, lips, mouths, and even arms and hands. 
These are the most common anthropomorphic traits that artists add to non-human design so that a majority of their audience is able to empathize more clearly with their characters. If your goal with the character design does not involve empathy, then perhaps these features aren't necessary. This is why imagery associated with animals like spiders, lizards, and fish is a go-to for antagonistic characters. Even without explicit characterization, features like these will cause a majority of audience members to assume the character is a villain. Again, I'm not saying it's impossible to create an empathetic looking insectoid character, it's just really, really tricky. And honestly, I can't think of a ton off of the top of my head. So is all of this to say that there is no place in modern media for a character that is void of anthropomorphic traits? Of course not. To reiterate, roles that don't benefit from being empathetic are perfect candidates for non-human designs. I'll reference a League of Legends character, for the sake of our fans who thought this would be our Skarna redesign video. Rek'Sai, probably the least anthropomorphic playable character in the game. No eyes, a mouth that opens three ways, an insectoid body, she doesn't even have voice lines. <laughs> Is this a bad character design because it doesn't have any anthropomorphic qualities? No, absolutely not. In fact, I really like Rek'Sai, and I know I'm not alone in thinking that. However, that doesn't change the fact that when compared to the other 157 champions in the game, she is one of the least played. Now, of course, we dance the line between discussing character design and discussing a specific game here, as there are several factors influencing her play rate. But her lack of any empathetic features whatsoever will certainly affect the way a majority of players react to her as a character. Even when compared to other non-human champions like Aurelian Soul, Tom Kench, or Ivern, she seems less like a playable character and more like a boss enemy in a sci-fi shooter game. Why? Because we have no way of empathizing with her as a character. It's not unfitting, her role in the story is little more than a big baddie terrorizing protagonists. However, it does, in the grand scheme of things, make her less appealing to the vast majority of fans and players. This is why we so often see alien characters that play important roles in sci-fi stories with anthropomorphic features. Who is more memorable for Mass Effect, Liara or Rex? Would Infinity War be a different movie if Thanos had no eyes and a serpent body? What if the Na'vi were insectoid rather than feline? Some alien races fill roles in their story that benefit from the species being physically indistinguishable from humans, like in Superman, Dragon Ball, or Invincible. It might have been hard for Lois Lane to fall in love with Clark Kent if he had scaly skin and crab claws instead of hands, and would Goku really be as popular if he was always in his great ape form? Essentially, humans or humanoid imagery evoke a stronger response out of most audiences because, at the end of the day, we are all human. Every story ever written was conceived, produced, and intended to be enjoyed by humans. And even when a story has no humans involved in it at all, it will always revolve around themes that are relevant to our human life. Artists can use our familiarity with human features to subvert our expectations. In horror, making a monster humanoid tends to make it that much more terrifying. Because we're conditioned to look for anthropomorphic features as a source of communication, intentionally removing or altering those attributes will make a character feel incredibly uncomfortable to look at. Slenderman is a great example of this. At first glance, he kind of just looks like a man in a suit, but a lack of any recognizable facial features and unusually elongated limbs will shift viewers into an uneasy state immediately. Why? Because they're desperately trying to interpret intentions from this strange being, but it's giving us nothing. Like, if you met Shao Kahn in the middle of a forest, you'd be scared, for sure. But you'd be scared because even if you knew nothing about him, you could guess right away that his intention was to tear you limb from limb. Compassion is for food. Slenderman, though, you don't know what he's going to do to you. Or, as another example, a bear. It's definitely scary, right? And its roar would send any sensible person running. But the bear from Annihilation? With a human skull fused to its own that screams like a tortured woman? That takes it from scary to cosmic horrifying. Let's move on, because now I've just frightened myself. Can we turn the lights up, please, and uh, play some music from, like, a, a Donkey Kong game or something? Okay. Uh, that's better. Now, a lot of you may be asking, what are the benefits of omitting human features? Why is Zootopia about a fox and a rabbit, and not a country girl and a sly city slicker? Disguising real-world issues behind friendly visuals is a great way to sell a story that might not be entirely kid-friendly to a much wider audience. The argument could be made that Zootopia is a movie about classism, racial profiling, government corruption, and even police brutality. Doesn't really sound like a Disney movie, does it? 
Taking this story out of our world and into a fictional one makes addressing these themes a little bit more manageable for a broader audience, as people who don't like to acknowledge such issues will be open to hearing about them without immediately being turned off. This kind of character design can also be a fun way to fold in cultural imagery with your stories. Kung Fu Panda could have just been a movie about a fat kid who wanted to be great, but turning his martial arts idols into physical manifestations of different Shaolin Kung Fu styles gives the whole world a unique and exciting personality that elevates the entire movie and makes it that much more iconic. It also further exaggerates conceptual themes in the movie. If the Furious Five were just a bunch of ripped dudes, the impact of Poe discovering that what makes us different is what makes us special might have been lost. You could do this with only human characters, but the imagery is so much more potent when you have scenes like this one, where a praying mantis squares off against a panda bear and wins. A lot of younger artists feel more comfortable expressing themselves through non-human characters as well. The real world is a scary place, and jumping right into addressing issues as literally as possible is a daunting proposition for anyone, especially kids. I had a teacher in college who told me that he, interestingly enough, got really into furry art as a young artist because it helped him avoid addressing the topic of race in his art, which for him was very sensitive. He later grew out of this phase, but non-human characters were a great way for him to transition into a more mature form of artistic expression. It was partially thanks to this professor that I myself began to rethink my own character designs and why I had avoided humans in my artwork for so long. I've been drawing for years, but I've really only started drawing human characters in the last decade or so of my life. As a kid, I avoided the subject, which I can now attribute to my social anxieties that continue to be a part of me even as an adult. I was such a nervous kid that even the idea of humans as a broad concept was disdainful for me, so I stayed away from them. I even found myself identifying with non-human characters in movies and TV shows. It made it easier for me to avoid addressing any of my issues if I felt like I wasn't even a human at all. Of course, I was, and still am, a human. Once I was able to grow, mature, and approach these struggles in more healthy ways, I became comfortable with and even enjoyed creating my own humanoid characters. I'm able to tell the story of my own life and experiences through the characters I create, and maybe help other people feel like it's okay to be human, even if it makes life a little bit harder. The best example I can think of that represents this growth is my group of original characters, the Freelancers. At the point of their conception, the freelancers were the embodiment of visual aesthetics that I personally loved. Sci-fi visors, crocodiles, gas masks, pretty ladies, spandex superheroes, and Magikarp. These five characters were really the first I created that were mostly human in their design, although they all obscured anthropomorphic features that I've discussed so far, primarily faces. This might have been because I wasn't very good at drawing faces at the time, but I think the reason I never developed that skill was actually due to my deep-rooted subconscious anxieties. As I matured both as an individual and as an artist, this began to change. Not only did my technical skills improve, but my developing sense of self-awareness allowed me to confront themes and imagery that had made me uncomfortable in the past. This character, Mr. Magic Man, who some of you have astutely pointed out bears a striking resemblance to myself, has probably changed the most over the years. Four Eyes, his twin sister, has remained the most consistent in her design. I think she's always been a representation of the parts of me that I feel are missing. Focus, determination, discipline, and tenacity. It's no surprise that she is the foil to Mr. Magic Man, and at the same time, both contrasts and completes him as a character. The last three, Sasha Shrapnel, Gallant, and Lockjaw, are less representations of myself, and are rather character design traits that I find personally exciting. Spontaneity and regression, restraint and composure, wisdom and competency. Visually, they have changed quite a bit too over the years. Gallant and Sasha have retained the consistency of their masks and general proportions, but Lockjaw has been completely reimagined several times. Initially, he was a crocodile, but when I made it to college, I got the idea to change the design to a gorilla. I thought it helped better convey his personality traits of hyper-intelligence and focused wisdom a little bit better. And, like we've been discussing, it lent itself to anthropomorphic features that made him more empathetic. Of course, this was right before Overwatch came out, and he ended up being almost exactly the same character as Winston. You could call this bad luck, but in all honesty, the concept of a hyper-intelligent gorilla character is really nothing new. So I switched him back to a crocodile. A few days ago, I uploaded a community poll to the YouTube channel to get a grasp on which of these five characters you guys like the best. A whopping 52% of you voted for Lockjaw as your favorite, with four eyes at a dead last. I guess switching him back to a crocodile was a good move. 
Nonetheless, I confess to being surprised with these results. I would love to know just a little bit more about why you voted the way you did. If possible, elaborate beyond... Crocodiles are cool. I mean, I agree with you, but why? Why are crocodiles cool? Is it because they've been around for millions of years? Is it their cold, emotionless demeanor? Maybe you like the way I've subverted traditional personality tropes for reptilian characters with Lockjaw's design. And what is it about Four Eyes and Mr. Magic Man that finds them falling in last place? I'm so curious to find out. At the end of the day, everyone is going to have a different answer to the question, are human or non-human character designs better? This is a good thing. From the dawn of human civilization, we used both kinds of imagery to tell our stories, and to choose one over the other would limit our potentials as creators. Some people enjoy the ambiguity of separating real-life themes from anthropomorphic imagery. Issues like race, age, sex, and gender are complicated and controversial, and sometimes it makes things easier to create characters that don't involve these kinds of topics at all. On the other hand, we are human. Whether we like to admit it or not, race, age, sex, and gender are all a part of our lives and a part of our history. Addressing them head-on with our characters is important if we want to continue to progress as a species, and as an artist myself, I believe it to be my responsibility to provoke a conversation about these topics with the characters I create. The next time you put pencil to paper, stylus to tablet, or even just watch the next League of Legends Champion reveal trailer, keep in mind what we've talked about here today. And of course, share your own thoughts on the topic with us down in the comments. Thanks for watching, guys. Please be sure to let me know in the comments if this is the kind of video you'd like to see more of in the future. Leave us a like and subscribe if you haven't already, and we'll see you in the next video.